are joining with audiences from across the globe to enjoy Harrogate International Festival's series of online events. Stream straight from our home to yours. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Secrets and Lies as part of the Theakston Old Peculiar Crime Writing Festival. Presented by Hachette. We promise you've got the best seats in the house. Hello everyone and welcome to a very special event for this year's virtual Harrogate Crime Festival. My name is Lisa and I am the books editor for Heat and Crime Monthly magazines. And I'm absolutely delighted to have a, to host this really special panel here today, which to give it its full title, and I'm going to have to read this, so bear with me, is the Theakston Old Peculiar Crime Writing Festival in partnership with Hachette, Secrets and Lies. I am joined by four authors who, although they don't need any introduction, I am going to ask them to give us one anyway in a minute. But just to let you know who's coming up, we've got Sabine Durant, author of Finders Keepers. We've got Araminta Hall, author of Imperfect Woman. We've got Dorothy Kimson, author of All My Lies Are True. And we have Louise O'Neill, oh, hitting the floor there. Louise O'Neill, author of After the Silence. So what we're going to do is we're going to get them to discuss, tell us a little bit about their latest novels and then a wider discussion on secrets and lies. And I know that lots of people watching are probably budding authors. So if we're lucky, maybe we'll get them to give us a tip or two on psychological and emotional thrillers. So just to have a bit of a Harrogate nostalgia to the proceedings, we're going to start with someone who I last saw on the grass outside the old Swan Hotel last year and that was Dorothy Coonson. Hello Dorothy. Hello. Hey. I remember running up to you and grabbing you again. Ah! Yes, it was Yay! the most amazing thing and I'm yeah. missing it so much. Oh I'm yes. I'm sure you are. Yeah. I'm sure everybody is missing. Yeah, I miss the events <laughs> and not the drinking lots of Prosecco constantly all day. <laughs> Actually, I didn't do that. I didn't do that obviously. <laughs> um, yes, I'm Dorothy Coonson and um, I'm, I'm going to be sensible now. Um, I've written 16 books. Um, my 16th book is All My Lies Are True. And it is the sequel to my 2010 book, The Ice Cream Girls. And in The Ice Cream Girls, the story of two women who, as teenagers, had an affair with a teacher and then were both accused of killing him. One of them, Poppy, went to prison. Um, Serena got away with it, or so they think. But Serena's lived the past 20 years, worried that someone's going to find out who she was and what she did. And then the book starts with Poppy being released from prison, determined to get revenge on Serena. And so that book ended. Not as many people wanted it to end, but it ended. <laughs> and then 10 years later, I've revisited the story with All My Lives Are True to find out where they are in their lives and also to tell the story of Serena's daughter who was 14 in the first book and is now 24 and discovering all the things that her mother got up to um, way back when. And her mother got up to quite a lot way back when as we She did, she did indeed. She, did. she just kind of finds out that her mother isn't the boring old woman that she thought she was, you know, the one that we also think our parents are kind of dull and haven't got a life and then discover that, you know, your mum was notorious and she did all these things and was accused of murder. So, yeah. Amazing. And Aramis, do you want to tell us about your fantastic new novel? Um, well, mine's my fourth novel, so not quite as impressive as Dorothy. Um, and um, it's about three women who have been... Um, really good friends for sort of 30 years since university and uh, at the beginning of the book one of the women dies and um, mm. it's it's sort of about the other two trying to piece together what happened but it's more about that moment in a woman's life um, where you sort of reevaluate all the choices you've made and um, all the decisions and all the responsibilities you've taken on and um, the life you're living. And they, they realize that they've all, they're all immersed in secrets and lies as much about themselves as anybody else. And so it's sort of that moment of reckoning in a woman's life that I think mm -hmm. lots of women um, come up against um, sort of in late forties and um, yeah, but all mixed in with, um, 
you know, like who did actually kill their friend as well. Yeah, there's certainly a lot in there that people will, will recognise, if whether that's flattering or not very flattering. Well, I hope them. so. Yeah. But they'll certainly recognise a lot of it. Sabine, what about your new novel? My um, oops, big uh, thriller is called Finders Keepers, or it's the wrong way around. Um, and it's about also about friendship. It's about an unlikely friendship between two neighbours. Um, Verity has lived in the same house all her life. She's 52 and um, she looked after her mother. She was born in the house herself and she has had a rather sort of, un, you know, rather sort of closeted and closed upbringing. Um, and she's a rather an eccentric character. She um, works for the OED. She writes definitions or she compiles definitions. And Elsa Tilson moves in next door, completely digs out the house, transforms you know, an ordinary house into kind of digs out the garden and the basement and the attic and turns it into this cream minimalist, um, you know, modern house. And is very different, much more of a sort of smug, entitled, um, woman and it's the relation the, the book begins when Elsa's husband Tom has died in suspicious circumstances um, and we know that Elsa has moved in with her next door neighbour and we go back and find out how you got to this position and you know maybe who's killed the husband and wh why things have become as tragic and as sort of catastrophic as they have. Amazing I, I'm uh, your, your one in particular appealed to me only because it's literally based up the road from here, from where I live. So I, every single description, even the bus <laughs> going by outside, I'm like, oh, I know I've been on that bus, I'm on that bus. <laughs> I'm a lazy writer because I live there too. And I, you know, I research lots of things, but it's quite nice to have a kind of environment that you just have to look out your window and describe. Exactly. And in fact, I, the house that I imagine, the houses that I imagine them living back onto me, that's what I sort of, yeah. Uh, slightly disconcerting to think that all of that's going on behind the net curtains literally up the road from here but we'll come to that in a minute and finally Louise what about your new novel well mine is definitely not based where you live <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I, um, it's my fifth novel um, after the silence and it is set on a small island off the coast of West Cork called Inish Rune, um, and this very wealthy, glamorous family, the Kinsellas, have set up an artist retreat centre there. And their youngest son has married a local woman, Keelan, and it's at Keelan's birthday party that this violent storm engulfed the whole island, um, cutting them off from the mainland. And the next morning, the body of a young woman is found. So no one can get on the island and no one can get off the island. So it has to have been someone there who's done it. Um, and then 10 years later, the murder of the, you know, just beautiful Vanessa Crowley still haunts the Irish people. So this um, team of documentary makers from Australia has come to the island, determined to figure out exactly what happened that night. Yeah, and it's, um, it's, it's something of a departure for you. Is it, is it right for me to say that? Yeah, no, that's right. Um, it's the first novel that has been, I suppose, termed as a psychological thriller. So I'm very mm -hmm. thrilled to sort of be in such um, amazing company. But you know, it was funny because it really felt like such a good fit when I was writing it. I was like, I was really enjoying, um, I don't know, working in a different genre, but I think just the pacing is different. Um, and it just felt like a really exciting challenge. Mm. No, it's fantastic. And okay. what strikes me is there are there aren't just a few secrets and lies in all of these novels. They are, it's so much woven into the fabric of these stories that it makes me think you've all got exceptionally devious minds. <laughs> Literally, we've got extramarital affairs, obsessive friendships, illicit relationships, and more than a few dead bodies. So as this is about secrets and lies, I wanna first ask each of you what it is about secrets and lies that is so endlessly fascinating and such a rich vein for you as writers. Dorothy? Uh, yeah, all, the, all those secrets <laughs> that I have. Do you know what? I really wish I was that interesting. I am so boring. <laughs> That's why I write books, because I need all the things that I'd love to do and love to happen to me. I wouldn't like, like anything that happens in my books to happen in my life. Um, I, I just love, I, I'm always fascinated by people. I've always been fascinated by people. Even when I was really young, I was always fascinated by people, the things they do, their thought processes, why they'll say one thing and then do another. And, mm -hmm. um, and I love exploring that in my books. And I love talking to people and finding out why they sort of hide things. I mean, you know, 
I love my neighbours, most of my neighbours, well, most of them. There's a couple I'm not that keen on, <laughs> and I'm sure they're going to appear in, in the book soon, um, <laughs> with all their lives completely rewritten for, for my entertainment. But um, I love my neighbours, but, you know, before I got to know them, I had all these stories made up about them, I, and I love doing that about people. You see people at bars, you think, well, I'm sure... <laughs> she does that and he does that and you know that's that's just like the source of it's my lifeblood I love doing things like that and you know um I'll be watching something on tv and um they'll be telling the story I'm like that's not the real story come on you've got a better story behind the scenes I just I just find <laughs> secrets and things like that endlessly fascinating I just love it I just love the the duality of you know you've got this and it's actually not a duality that sounds like it's either or but there's people who have this really good public face and not far behind, they've got another face and then they've got another face that they deal with other people. So yeah, I love sort of like getting behind the different faces that people have and to see what the motivation is for them all. Would you say that's the same for you, Araminta? Is it about kind of... Yeah, not, the, I was thinking when Dorothy was speaking actually, um, I always have this sort of narrative running through my head, well, I'm sure everyone does, when anybody speaking as I sort of am thinking I wonder what you're really thinking because so often when we are talking and that's where we're really good friends we've got you know we've got our own narrative running through our heads and we're not actually saying all the things we think and um and then even when you are really good friends with someone there are certain things that we don't say because we don't want to hurt them or we don't want to reveal something really ugly about ourselves and I guess, I mean, you know, we're all thriller writers. So I, well, actually any writer, I would say, you know, when you want to write, you know, the idea for your book comes and the characters come and everything, but actually you've got to entertain people. And so you need, you, we all are looking for that moment, aren't we? Of like, well, how are people going to, why are people going to be interested in this book? So, you know, secrets and lies are just such a fertile ground because as soon as you know someone's hiding a secret, you sort of also know it's going to come out somehow in the book. So I think that's why I'm so drawn to both things. And yeah, I just think it's, it's just so human, isn't it? To mm -hmm. constantly be keeping little secrets, little lies, you know, and most of them don't matter or mean anything. But of course, I think actually in all our books, we, we've got things that do matter quite a lot. So. <laughs> No, definitely. You, you all deal with big themes, which I'm going to come to you later. But is it the same for you, Sabine? Is this yeah, what I mean, you I totally doing? agree with everything that um, everyone said so far. I mean, I think, in, you know, it's right that all these books deal with big secrets and big mm -hmm. things that people, maybe even big lies that people have got hidden away. And what I try to do, although my character at one point says in this book, you know, what is a secret? Isn't it just something you choose not to tell other people? You know, we're, all, we're all allowed secrets. But in her case, she's, it's the little lies that we're all, that we would call white lies, that actually are, are what cause the terrible events in her soul and in, and in the book. Because Elsa is one of those people who says things just to be polite and kind and nice. But, you know, she'll say, oh, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Or what would I do without you? And things that just are little lies, they're just little lies. But to Elsa, they, to Verity, she takes them on board and she becomes... She dwells on them and thinks that they, they mean the truth. And it's when she begins to realise that actually it's just words and it's not, you know, although she's got secrets of her own, those little tiny little things are what, you know, sets the book off on its catastrophic path. Mm. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I can completely see that with yours, that it is, it's more the little, the little things and, and almost that social politeness. Yes, it's just white lies. It's humiliation. Yeah. 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 Well, that's Sort of things that you would say, like, oh, you must come over, not, not, not wanting that person to yeah, come over. Yeah, she says, see you on Wednesday, and Elsa, th you know, yeah. Verity waits and waits to Wednesday, oh. thinking, you know, oh, when's it going to be? And then Wednesday comes and goes, and for her, it's huge. <laughs> that's, that's really tragic. <laughs> and Louise, is it the same for you? Is it the same allure? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Um, I've spoken about this before, but when I, I had an eating disorder as a teenager and when I was in recovery, um, the therapist said at the time, she was like, you know, you're only as sick as your secrets. Um, mm -hmm. And it was something that really stuck with me. Um, I suppose that idea of presenting a false self um, to the rest of the world and the psychological damage actually that that can cause if you're doing it like long term. 
And when I was researching um, after the silence, um, I spoke to a lot of people who had grown up on the islands, the offshore um, islands on Ireland. So like there might be a hundred people who live there. Um, and the one thing that all of them said was that there is no possibility of having secrets that you know everything about your neighbours and that there's a level of safety in that and that you kind of have to in order to survive, like especially the winter, in order to survive that, you have to know everything about your neighbours. And I kept thinking, well, if someone was murdered and, you know, you didn't know who did it or there was no justice, I suppose, how that would reverberate throughout the entire community and the ripple impact that would have. And I was like, okay, this is exactly what I want to write about. Because <laughs> it's quite interesting you say community because all of these novels take place in very domestic settings. So reading them, we could be forgiven for thinking that the most dangerous place is our own homes. Well, it's true, it is, in fact. Is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So carry on. I was going to say, how do you each go about making ordinary situations and places so sinister? But, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Often we are in the most dangerous place but but in fact and let me ask you this question because a lot of the novels almost all of them have domestic violence coercive control gaslighting at their heart and I think it's fair to say that the men do not acquit themselves very well in any of these novels so what 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 makes you want to tackle those themes and do you feel a responsibility to re you must feel a responsibility to really get that right so Sabine, what, Sabine is probably not quite no, as not much. So much. I mean, I pl I, uh, Verity becomes obsessed with the mm. relationship next door. I mean, she's listening literally with a glass against the wall. She's convinced that um, Elsa needs her help, that she needs to be rescued from a mm. coercive, controlling relationship. Um, and I think I do leave it sort of open as to whether that is true or not. It's really, it's more that Verity is absorbing what you've been just been saying by reading about things in papers and in in books and things and um i think it's sort of left open-ended really i think the relationship is probably not ideal but i think also i'm twisting it a bit i mean i don't want to give too much away but i think things nothing is quite as it seems so i wouldn't say that it's a particularly good example probably unlike my cohorts here <laughs> yeah there was definitely <laughs> I mean, Dorothy, yours is a lot around that scenario. Yeah, I mean, um, the first book was um, the Ice Cream Girls was a lot about mm -hmm. um, the aftermath of these two girls, as they were, they were girls being groomed by a teacher, and then the aftermath and growing up and being an adult, and then your past coming back to haunt you. And I wanted to, um, with this book particularly, I wanted to look at how it's changed because we know so much more about coercive control. I mean, there's new laws about around coercive control, but we're all so much more clued up about emotional abuse and mental abuse on top of physical abuse. And, you know, we know about financial abuse and sexual abuse in the confines of a relationship. So I want, what I wanted to do was see if anything had changed, if we had changed as not necessarily the people in an abusive relationship, because that hasn't changed at all, but how the rest of us on the outside of it looking in, and that's part of it, isn't it? Part of our, our mm. lives is our friends and our family and seeing what's going on with them and deciding whether we're going to um, step in or help. And um, also what I wanted to do was to make it unclear for um, the people who've been in an abusive relationship to see if, the, if their loved ones who were in an abusive relationship now were actually the perpetrator or the victim. So you're not sure if it is the typical idea of, of the man being the abuser or if it is, because mm. um, my main character is called Verity as well, um, if, if Verity um, is abusing um, the guy she's involved with or if he's the one who's being the abuser. So I wanted to do, do that because there are so many nuances to mm. abusive relationships that people don't, that we, we think we're aware of, but we're not sure of. And that puts us in this position of not knowing who to believe and what to believe at any at one time, or to wonder if that person is as bad as we think they are because they do these terrible things. Um, but, you know, it, our home is where we are, is, is who we are. And, and if, you're, if you're not safe at home, as in most of the main characters aren't, 
you want you want the reader to understand that that's where a lot of the things because we're gonna we've kind of we've always grown up with this idea that it's stranger danger that strangers are the ones who mm. come you know who kind of perpetrate most of these crimes but the reality is it's mm. almost always somebody you know or it's almost always somebody in your small community as in your your circle who does the the bad things and that's why for me I find that fascinating as well the fact that we have these dangerous people in our lives and we kind of invite them in or they're they're there but we don't like to think about the fact that this is you know if someone's going to do you in it's going to be someone you know rather than a stranger well most most likely so that's Mm -hmm. a cheery thought (laughs) (laughs) yeah Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dorothy. <laughs> it's completely true. And Louise, for example, the the sort of coercive control in your novel is much more insidious, which is mm. which is often what happens, isn't it? I mean, as readers, we're not sure, and certainly the main character isn't even sure yeah. that she's being abused. Yeah, I think, I mean, when I knew that it was going to be a situation where um, Keelan's husband was going to be the main suspect um, in this murder, I think the first question that came up was, why would a woman stay with someone like that? Mm. And I think that's the, like, the really problematic question that comes up time and time again when you hear about women who are trapped in, you know, either emotionally abusive or violent relationships. Oh, you know, why why do they stay? And I suppose we put that onus time and time again on the woman, on the victim, um, that they're the ones who are supposed to, I suppose, um, to break free of that. We never ask, why does the perpetrator um, do this? And I suppose, you know, I would agree with Dorothy. You know, I, I, I think during lockdown, it's one thing that's really... I've kept thinking about, I suppose, when we're all at home, and for so many people, like, home is a really dangerous, frightening place to be because mm-hmm. they're in relationship um, and I think that's why when I was writing this I was like this is something that I feel is really important and it was an issue that I was just I just really wanted to to talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah it, they're all very of the moment and very timely aren't they especially like you say in times where you know women's aid is struggling and, and other organizations are struggling to help women and they're in the most danger because they're locked in with men that are horrible to them I mean Araminta yours what struck me about yours was that was that the guys in it very often just demeaned the women undermined the women made them feel rubbish essentially about themselves they're meant to love them but they're constantly being told they're useless and you know everybody in yours is at it with someone who is not their partner yeah (laughs) yeah that's very true um I think, um, well, I think I have one really horrible man in my book. And the other man I think is not, I think he's quite normal. He's, uh, you know, he's he's not particularly horrible. Um, but I think that, I mean, I, going back to the idea of why we use the domestic setting, for me, especially in Imperfect Women, um, I think the domestic, I mean, it is very true that um, we can all stay away from the darkened street or the, you know, you, you know, we can try to do that. But obviously, when you're in your own home, you, you know, it's terrifying to think that there are people in their own homes who can never get away from the situation they're in. But actually, on another level as well, which I've tried to do in Imperfect Women, is I think that domestic settings are just incredibly frightening for a lot of women, even when you're not being abused, when nothing is happening. I mean, you know, there are certainly times when you have young children and, and where you just feel this huge weight of expectation. I think women put this massive, massive weight of expectation on themselves where they want to achieve everything in a way that men actually don't. Men, men let themselves not be good at certain things or just achieve one thing. And, and so I think domesticity itself is actually really scary for women uh, for a lot of women I'm sure there are lots of women who love it as well but I mean that's just you know talking from a personal experience I think that it's uh, I think the whole idea of it is quite crushing and hard for women so in a way what I was trying to do was try to sort of like externalize an internal horror but also <laughs> setting it in this very internal space as well so um 
Yeah, I mean, that's a really bleak view as well <laughs> of, of like the, the idea that domesticity is like a horror show. But I do, it does sometimes, it did, well, especially, you know, it did feel like that to me when I was younger and my children were younger and everything. Sometimes you just think, it's just like a nightmare. <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, <laughs> everything is gone that, you, you know, made you you. So that's what I was sort of trying to show. It is quite interesting that aspect of your your domestic surroundings being adept, somehow how you define yourself. I mean, that's exactly. what you said. Yeah. Um, so in that, set, I mean, in my book, the woman is a hoarder. So her yeah. the house, the building in which she lives, her battle is really with the building, I suppose, mm. and with her own desire to fill it, which comes from somewhere sort of very damaged inside her. But you know, it is it's interesting, isn't it? Your so your surroundings are particularly for women, I think, how, quite, how a lot of women define themselves by the place in which they live. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely, yeah. And what struck me in all of yours as well was, was the, the, the weight, like you were saying, I mean, to the weight of maternal responsibility, that, that the amount of sacrifice that all of these characters make for their children. Is that, so that's obviously something which, which you kind of were thinking about as you were writing. Yeah, was, I, I just yeah. think it's still... I think women are asked to, women are, are sort of expected to do both in a way that, that men still are not entirely. And mm. my husband would kill me for saying that because he doesn't, you know, it's like there are many men who that's not true of, obviously. But I, I you know, I just feel that there's a, a, women just feel this pressure to be a very good mother and have a very good career, which I don't think which I think is really, really damaging. And I think it means that we end up not doing either particularly well. Well, that's what it feels like. You know, you feel like you're not doing either particularly well. And I do think there's, I mean, it's a wonderful sacrifice in many ways, you know, and it's wonderful. You know, well, I've absolutely loved having kids, but it's also, it is a huge, amazing sacrifice that we do we, that, that that happens with it isn't it now my kids are all older now and I look at people with young children I think my god I can't believe I ever chose that it's so weird you know? <laughs> it's such an odd thing to do but you know I loved it when I was doing it but. and so par sort of parental responsibility is, is really big in yours Dorothy as well isn't it like that the mother-daughter relationship is is examined in in really great detail do you think yeah and, and that's because Verity finding out who her mother really is and and go through that process of the you know as Louise was saying the whole why don't you leave why don't you do this and oh if I was in that situation I would do this and having no clue that you know it's not that simple it really isn't that simple you know mm. to walk away and the fact that you're almost brainwashed at the beginning in this relationship that's almost always perfect you know the start of a, of a relationship that's all hearts and flowers and being made to feel like the most amazing person in the world and then you know it slowly gets worse and worse and worse but you know in your heart and we're constantly told fed these messages from all over you know from the movies we read we watch mm -hmm. and the books we read and the music we listen to that love can conquer all and you know and that person they loved you at the beginning and so they can you know so they can be that person again and you just have to go through a little bit of hard hardship mm -hmm. and you know all relationships have their ups and downs but in abusive relationships they're up here completely up in the sky and then they mm -hmm. kind of go slowly down and then they go up again and up and the up goes gets shorter and it lasts for that long and the bad is, is that long. Um, but, you know, we're kind of almost brainwashed to, to cling on to thinking that it's going to get better again. I can get mm. that person back, the mm -hmm. person who I loved and I adored. I can get them back. Um, and so when Verity discovers all this stuff about her mother, she kind of is almost in that, in that place of sort of almost hating her mother because she... She can't see why she didn't just walk away. And that's a lot of the time, you know, with most abusive relationships, the people on the outside go, why didn't you walk away? And that's why I wanted to examine why is it 10 years later after writing mm -hmm. the book? And here it was so many different people saying that's what their experience was like. Now that we know more, are you still going to respond in the same way? And unfortunately, you do, you know, 
things haven't changed that much. They haven't, because a lot of us don't want our life to change. And when our mm. friends' relationships change, they, you know, our lives change with them. So, and for Verity, she finds this stuff out about her mother and her mother isn't sure why her daughter, her relationship with her daughter is falling apart. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's what I wanted to look at. I wanted to look at what it was like. To, and then, you know, lots of things happen. I'm trying not to spoil the book. <laughs> it's I, have, hard. I, have, I have a lot of time oh, yeah. trying not to spoil the book and um, mm-hmm. talking about it without spoiling it. But when things happen and, and then Serena finds herself in a position of going, oh, my, my daughter's not who I thought she was. Just mm-hmm. as Verity went, oh, my mother's not who I thought she was as well. But yeah, the, and you know, and for Evan, Verity's father as well, sort of like falling out with his wife over the fact that she can have doubts about their daughter. So yeah, there's a lot of parental stuff in it and relationship stuff. I mean, I love writing about relationships, mm-hmm. messed up relationships, but I love writing about <laughs> them. Yeah. They're all about toxic relationships, but actually just thinking about the domestic setting and not being able to escape. Probably, Louise, yours is the epitome of that, given that they're on an island that they literally yeah. can't, can't get away from. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the reason why I said it on an island was when I was a child, we, there's a, an island off the coast of West Cork called Cape Clear, and my parents brought us there, and we missed the last ferry home. And I remember just being so panicked because I think it was that real realisation of, oh, we're trapped here, like we're not getting off this island. Um, and it's really stayed with me ever since, you know, especially when there's a storm or when, you know, there's really bad weather because I'm like, no one can get on that island and no one can get off. And I start thinking, well, what if someone goes into labour? or What if someone has a heart attack and they, there's literally no way of getting to the mainland. So it just seems like the perfect place, I suppose, to to position something like this, you know, when that thought of a murder happening and being like, it has to be someone um, on this island. So it, yeah, it's, I suppose it's just like, you know, the Agatha Christie, kind mm-hmm. of like the closed mm-hmm. quarters. I was like, it can't get any better than, um, than an island, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. But one thing that strikes me about all of your characters, actually, is that, sort of the act of keeping secrets it although it puts the characters in often often deadly danger there also seems to be a sense that they're somehow in intoxicated by the lies that they're weaving so i was wondering if you would would you say would you agree that there's something about keeping secrets that ironically makes your characters actually feel alive in some way do they thrive off their own secrets and lies would you say well, it's a very good question. Um, I think the way in which I'll take it is um, my novel is a first person narrative and Verity is obviously an unreliable narrator mm-hmm. and she loves words. She loves, you know, pinning things down, describing things, making sense. She's trying to control her environment and trying to sort of get control of her life, I suppose. So. I would say that she's enjoying, that she does get, she is liberated by what she says and what she isn't saying. And I think as a reader, the joy of these books is trying to work out what is being withdrawn, what is being kept back. And almost thinking that you're half a step ahead, that you're, you know, you want your reader to be getting there just a fraction of a second before you reveal. And, um, so in that sense, I think, yes, it is a sort of liberation and it is a choosing what to tell. And as a writer, choosing what to, with, what to tell when is, you know, the most brilliant thing, I think. It's the most fun in writing is working out, playing a cat, game of cat and mouse with the reader. Yeah, no, definitely. I was thinking about your verity as well, actually, the way that she's, she sort of, she, she, she can't wait to be included, can she? She sort of thrives off all of that. Yeah, she's definitely part of their family. She's had no family of her own. She's sort of had this very dysfunctional relationship with her mother, for whom she's been the main carer. And in fact, interesting what Dorothy was saying, and and Araminta too, that that her mother's grew her, you know, her upbringing was all about everything being lovely, that that she anthropomorphized everything so that even the eggs in the egg box in the fridge, you couldn't bear to separate, you could never separate two eggs or tear apart two tea bags. And so everything was sort of very sort of precise and, and almost too twee. 
Um, and she was be sort of stuck in this world. So when she sees this life next door with this rather glamorous woman and her wonderful children, she becomes obsessed by being part of their family, particularly the younger son. Is the, she, sort of, she thinks that they're not giving him a good enough deal and making him, the, fa that the father's Tom is desperate for the child to be a mini him and he's sort of not, he's much dreamier. So she becomes, she's, her obsession is, be, is to become part of that family, I suppose, mm. yeah. It's devastating actually. I mean, I guess, in fact, while I'm thinking about it, like all of your narrators, should we trust anything that they say, essentially? Because all of them seem a little bit unreliable. Would you say that, they, that the very act of telling the story is, is a lie in itself in some way? All my, all my, all my characters are very honest. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were saying, oh, my lives are true. <laughs> mine are, but they're lying to themselves. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I would say. I think it's about the lying to yourself. That's what all my yeah. characters are doing. They're not actively lying to the reader as such, mm. but they're, um, apart, apart from I've got one big secret in the centre of my book, but I agree. I think, it's, I think what's fascinating about a lot of psychological thrillers is that way that we, you know, we have to, as the reader, we have to unpick the moment that the, the main characters realise that their lives are built on a lie or that there's a big central lie that, have, that has been causing them to behave in that way. But I don't think, I don't think any of, I don't think, I can't think of many psychological thrillers where the, where the narrator out and out lies to the reader. Oh. I would say it's a yeah. rule not to, in fact, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a book by Ruth Ware where she starts by saying she's going to lie. Uh -huh. All right. I think, she, I think it's a turn of the key. I think she starts off by saying yeah. she's going to lie because she wants people to hear her story in right. the best possible light because she's... I might have, I might have mm. remembered that completely wrong. But at least so, she's honest uh, about the fact that she's... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. I don't think... With, with my characters, particularly, particularly Serena uh, and Poppy, to a certain extent, they aren't lying to themselves so much as worried about how people will see them. So they're kind mm -hmm. of, but they all feel sick about it, and they they are honest with themselves that they're that they're not being a hundred percent honest. But I mean, there's a big part of all my lives are true with, when Poppy admits something, which um, she can't obviously tell anybody that. Um, so she's not actually lying to herself or anybody else, but she's kind of she's kind of caged by her lies, her by her secrets, I suppose, rather than lies. They're secrets that she's kind of caged by, and I think that's what a lot of them are. With um, Verity and the secret relationship she's got going on, she's um, kind of caged by those secrets, and because of those secrets, she's having to lie mainly by omission to people, and mm -hmm. then discovering that as because she's not telling people things, she's going to have to start up telling outright lies. But she's kind of honest with herself and the reader about those things but, and the reasons why she's doing the things she does because you can see why she's doing it. Not, um, and I wouldn't have said, um, because I've, I've read Araminta's book, I, I don't think that she's, any of them really, really lies, do they? No, they're not lying in to them. themselves. I think so much as yeah, they're, they're like. Of, I think it's that process of going get into that process, and it sounds like all the other books are as well. That process of kind of being aware of who you are and the life you you've kind of created, not necessarily from your lies and secrets, but mm -hmm. just how you've kind of allowed yourself to be shunted down this path mm -hmm. in life that not necessarily one you wanted. I might be speaking out of turn there. I'm sorry <laughs> if I am. <laughs> no. But it sounds well, what like about you're you? Sorry. What about you, Louise? Would you say, should we be trusting your narrators? I mean, I think the whole point with Keelan is that she wants to keep this secret. It's to protect her family. And I suppose, you know, she's had a failed marriage and she's so determined. You know, her failed marriage was in the 90s, which in Ireland would have been like just really shocking at the time you know the divorce was very um was very recent and very new so i think she's so determined that this family that she's going to kind of prove to everybody that she can do this and that she can have a successful and, and she wants to protect her children and i mean i don't have like i don't have kids um but it's been i suppose 
even growing up, I think I, I was able to see that the sacrifices that my mother was expected to make were very different to the sacrifices that my father was expected to make, that she was supposed to give completely of herself. Um, and I remember reading The Awakening when I was in college and, you know, Edna says, uh, that line about, you know, I would give up anything for my children, but I won't give up myself. And she's considered a bad mother because of that. Um, and I just think that's so, for me, it was not, uh, I, even listening to Araminta, I'm like, this sounds terrifying. I'm not sure if I would ever want to be a mother. So but that idea, of, <laughs> yeah, you've completely scared me now, Araminta. That's it. it's, <laughs> it's that idea of keeping secrets and, you know, telling lies, but feeling like, that it's for the greater good because you want to protect your family. I just find that really fascinating. I suppose that just that determination to protect your family um, above all else. Mm, no, I completely agree with you. So ladies, we're coming up to around 45 minutes. So I just want to quickly ask you a couple of more general questions if I can. Um, so this is obviously a crime festival and women are huge consumers of crime and psychological thrillers. Do you, do you know as writers what it is about these genres that speak to women? What it is that, that's drawing women in so much? Um, well, I mean, part of my book, you know, is I suppose that idea of true crime, that these people that have come to the island uh, are, you know, are doing a, a documentary. And I think I'm really fascinated by that because I've seen with so many of my friends like that they love these true crime documentaries and the more grisly, the better. And what's really strange is that most of the women or most of the victims tend to be female. Um, so I'm not sure if it's like some sort of, a bit like watching a horror movie that you're mm. to, to watch it for clues to see, you know, what they've done. I mean, quote unquote wrong that you wouldn't do if you were in that scenario because I suppose you know for women I think there's such a fear constantly of of rape and murder that mm -hmm. I don't know if watching it play out in either in fiction or in on a podcast or on a documentary feels like some sort of psychological relief in some way. Mm. No, I mean, that's the Dermot thing isn't it which is that we even as a small child we've grown up with the fear of rape so somehow to read about rape and violence or is somehow a kind of exorcism and a kind of control. Yeah. But, yeah, I so kind of that, but I wouldn't say any of ours are particularly necessary, that sort of book, we're not, talk, we're not mm. talking about gritty. No. I think it's an interesting thing, which is with, you know, going back to Secrets and Lies, which is that women, in my experience, are just more interested in other people. They're we're nosier, we want to know the secret. Mm. I mean, my husband can go out for dinner with someone and I say, what happened with his daughter? And, the, and you know, oh, I didn't ask, you know, they just talk about school. <laughs> And so I think there's partly that and partly that we like to solve things. And I think if there's a, a sort of some, you start reading a novel and you want to, you know, women want to know the answer. I think that's, I just think that is true that our brains work differently. I got in trouble on Women's Hour saying that we read with our left and our right brains and men only read with one side of their brain, which I read somewhere and I'm sure it's true. But um, I think, you know, we're reading to find out about character, but also to find out, you know, what is what is going on here? You know, mm -hmm. why has this happened, or why is this going to happen? And we do. Yeah, there is a fact that women buy more books and read more books than the men. That is one of the reasons why we read so much about this stuff. And also, I think it can feel like a bit of a talisman to keep all that stuff away from you. That you know that you. It's almost like if you read about it first, you find out about it first. You're not. It's not going to happen to you. It's not going to be. Or also, or to make um, sense of your reality, because I get a lot of emails from readers who who say that my book has kind of helped them with something that they didn't want to deal with, and not just this book, but other books as well. That you know that it helped them to make sense of stuff, the stuff that they can't talk to their friends about, they can't um, talk to anybody about, or understand, or um, I can't remember what they're saying now, but um, I think you know. I, I do think I do think the bottom line is that women read more, and I think, as Sabine says, it is part of the. When you read, you're curious about stuff. You want to mm -hmm. find out more about stuff and different people and different types of, you know. And that's why I I think people should read as widely as possible, not just stick to one type of thing because mm -hmm. you don't find out anything other than your direct experience if you're just reading books by people who are like you. And I suppose a lot of us are fascinated by murder and stuff like that. And um, 
all these hideous things that are happening behind closed doors um, because we never do it ourselves. And it's almost mm-hmm. like being able to step into that, the killer's footsteps and be that killer for that, you know, for 500 pages. And then you can walk away and go, I didn't actually kill anybody. But I know what it's like. <laughs> um, so I think that's part, that could be part of the reason as well. Yeah, definitely. That vicarious experience. Yeah. <laughs> so my last question, um, obviously lots of people go to the Harrogate Crime Festival, people who go are budding authors. So I wondered if you wouldn't mind just giving maybe a tip or two for anyone who, who wants to write their own emotional or psychological thriller, what would be your top tip for them? Araminta. Um, I think everyone always says it, but reading, and I totally agree with Dorothy, I think whatever genre you want to write in, you should read every genre and loads of different, you know, and, and, but having said that, if you do know you want to write in a particular genre, you should also really, really research that and look into it and see what, you know, see what's happening and what, you know, how to do it. And then, But then otherwise, for me, I think it's always that thing of a character comes to me first Mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. And I really want to tell that character's story. And I really want to, I need to know everything about that character before I start. And then normally I'll have an idea of a theme that I want to discuss. And actually, I think, well, I'm talking for myself. I think, you know, my themes always sort of go through all my books. I'll probably, you know, so it's like, you, you, I think most writers are, are just uh, sort of concerned with with sort of a couple of really big topics. Yeah, but so for me, I think it's just like that, like taking time to just really think about who you're writing about and what you want to say. And then I think the story comes, the plot comes. I I think the plot is the easier part because I think it's quite fluid, which I think most people, I think people would presume when you write thrillers that the plot is the most important thing, but I, I would disagree. I'd say you need a character to carry you through. And once you've, as you, well, if your characters are completely believable, you can sort of do anything with plot. I mean, you've got to have a really <laughs> tight plot by the end, but those first few drafts, you can sort of play around with the plot a bit no, more. No, I agree. It's a voice, isn't it? It's getting the voice. That's what, yeah. Yeah. And also I would just say write every day. I just think yeah. you know, lots of people say, oh, I want to write a book. And just write every single day, even if it's, you know, 500 words, 400 words a day, just do it every single day, seven days a week to get yourself going until you're, you've got something under your belt. And then when you see it, it's like knitting. It's just fantastic. You think, oh, I've done all of that. <laughs> and yeah. keep on going. Also, somebody once said to me, you know, write as if, I mean, it's sort of contradictory of the not, because I completely agree, actually, with the Araminta, once you've got your character and your voice, the plot comes. But I also think that it's very good to have a, to think that what you're writing has actually happened, that it has already happened, and that you're just writing it down. And that means that you're, you know, you miss out all the detail. You don't bother describing, you know, the pen at great detail. You know what matters. You keep on going because you've got this sense of where it's going. So that's what I would say. Imagine it's already happened and you're literally reporting it in the most interesting way and do it every day. Oh, amazing. Dorothy? Um, similar to Sabine and Araminta, I just say stop talking about it and just sit down and write it because, mm. my goodness. I think I told you that, Lisa, didn't I? <laughs> yes, I <laughs> I've said that to so many people. Just stop talking about it because we all sit there and we talk about it. I want to write, I want to write, I want to write. But not, that's not actually getting it written so just just literally sit down and write it and then worry about everything else getting it published and everything else afterwards just sit down mm. don't tell other people your story just sit down and tell and tell the page your story until it's mm. done amazing and louise yeah i think that's what dorothy said is so true i think that people often believe that there's some kind of secret and that it's like you're like a member of the illuminati you've written a novel and that we all are you know know the secret and we're not telling anyone else and really it is just about sitting down and getting the words on the page um and other than that i think it's really important to pay attention um, you know, especially when I'm talking to younger people who want to be writers, I'm like, you know, you have to listen. Like, you know, you, if you're on a train or a bus, you know, don't always, you know, have your earphones in or um, have your headphones on. Like, really be paying attention, listening to how people talk, listening to, 
you know, the, the cadence of their, of their language and their dialogue. Um, and I think that, that and also you never know when you might overhear. I think Maeve Binchy used to eavesdrop um, on people all the time to try and see if she could get ideas for stories. So you never I know where that. your inspiration is going to hit. <laughs> That's what I do all the time. Oh, yeah. Follow people around, listen to their conversations, people talking on their mobile phone like they're at home. Great. Yeah. All these <laughs> ideas. Yeah. All these fantastic yeah. conversations. Oh, ladies, thank you ever so much for joining us today. I'm really, it's been a fantastic discussion and just thank you. And do, do all, not all of your novels are out at the moment, I don't think. If you want to just quickly oh, yeah. shout out your release date or if you're out already, please do it now. Mine's out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mine is coming. Well, mine came out 9th of July. Excellent. I'm, mine's out on the 20th of August. And Louise? Mine is September 3rd. 3rd. Brilliant. So we've actually got time to buy them all and read them all. So yeah, that actually works out quite nicely. <laughs> we can start here and then go round. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, thank ladies, you. for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks for joining us. If you have enjoyed this event as part of the Harrogate International Festivals, please do think about a donation to ensure that our festivals can survive in the future. Donations can be made by texting HIF and the amount to 70085. For more events, please visit our online hub, the HIF Player. It's packed with upcoming live streams, events you've missed, archive recordings and much more.